It is so good to see so many of you in worship today. We've had a great morning, and we're thankful that you're a part of that. And as you're turning in your Bibles today, as we step into the story of God's redemptive love, let's look at Matthew chapter 5, and we'll specifically look at verse 8. But as you're turning there, let me encourage you, if you're not currently attending a small group, life group class on Sundays, we want to invite you to do that. If you'd reach out to any one of us on staff, we could suggest a class for you. And that's part of why we have gone to two services with one life group time in the middle to give everybody an opportunity to attend class. And so uh, we encourage you to do that. We've been considering the Beatitudes, which could be uh, titled Stepping Stones to Authentic Happiness. Stepping Stones to Authentic Happiness. The word blessed means to be satisfied, fulfilled, content, uh, speaks of an abundant life. And so as we look at them today, uh, we're coming to verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. But I want to begin reading back in verse 3. Look with me, if you will, beginning in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here in the text, we have eight beatitudes, eight stepping stones to authentic happiness. And when we think about them, four of those are dealing entirely with the inner principles of our hearts and minds. They're concerned with the way that we see ourselves before God. And the next four are outward manifestations or practical applications, if you will, or overflows of those attitudes. For example, those who are poor in spirit, And if you remember, we talked about being poor in spirit means to know that you are bankrupt before God without hope in eternity, that your bank account, spiritually speaking, is empty of any hope in the future with no opportunity uh, to redeem or right yourself before God. But when you know that and God recognizes that you know that, then he is merciful to you and extends that mercy to you. The second one is, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be what? Comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. What are we mourning over? Obviously, you mourn when a loved one passes away. But what we're talking about here is a person who is mourning the sin of their own life the sin of others' lives, and the sin of mankind as a whole. You are grieved by sin and the depravity of your life and of man in general that hurts the heart of God. So when you feel that, God says that he will comfort you. And so as we think about today, those who are meek seeking to make peace, uh, we're, we are strength under control Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are never unwilling to pay the price for being persecuted. But when we mourn over sin, it is then that God purifies our heart. When Jesus spoke of being pure in heart, he was emphasizing again the inner person. The motive of the heart is what he was dealing with. The phrase does not simply refer to doing the right thing, but doing the right things for the right reason. Being free from duplicity or or uh, double-mindedness, hypocrisy, or living a sham of a life. In other words, you live this way on Sunday and you live another way on the rest of the week. I was sharing with the people at Keys Ferry this morning something I kind of inserted as I was going along, and I will share this with you. You know, I didn't go to church till I was 15 years of age. So I didn't understand the church culture. I didn't understand that families could be in an all-out battle on the way to church, but as soon as you pull in the parking lot, everybody put on the lipstick of perfection. 
Uh, see, you're laughing because you know what I'm talking about. You know, your parents are about to clobber each other in the car. Some kids, you're swatting at them in the back there trying to keep them apart. And so I didn't know all that. I thought that everybody acted through the week like they acted in the sanctuary. So when I was 14, my parents separated for a year. Then they got back together. My mother got pregnant with my youngest brother, Michael. She said, we're going to go to church. We went to church. We went to a church building. I remember nothing spiritual happening for a year. And then, praise God, we went to a different church. And when in that church, the Holy Spirit was tugging on my heart through the preaching of the Word. I was saved. Then I started feeling a call to ministry, went off to college to a Baptist university and thought I was going to get a Christian education. That was a joke. Uh, it was more worldly than the world. But then I went to a little church in the country being invited to preach at 19 years old, and I preached every Sunday for three years. And during that time, uh, I was looking, and I established in my mind over these years of college and high school that if a person had gray hair and was in the church, they were a holy person. I had established that if people were in their middle aged and they had families, teenagers, that they were holy people. Everybody at church talked so nice to each other. I never heard anybody cuss at each other. I never heard anybody arguing. Of course, I'd never been to a deacon's meeting at any of the churches and so I, or church conferences. So in the little church I pastored, we didn't have conference. The people just told me what was going on, and that's what we did. And so I thought everybody was so nice. But when I was a senior, I decided I was not going to seminary, and I was going to go into business with my dad, all the while knowing I was called to be a pastor. So I started in business, real estate, development, building, and we manufactured log houses. And so I started working with people I had been to church with in Atlanta, people that were criminals, basically. Their conversations outside of the church was foul. It was awful. I'm looking at these people. In fact, uh, I, w I was taking a man who gave me his Christian testimony on one uh, outing when we were looking for him some property, uh, and then he ended up sticking me for the tune of about $60,000. But we didn't need to have a written agreement according to this Christian man because we were both Christians and we do the right thing, and then he cheated me out of a $60,000 commission in my 20s, and I about thought enough of the church. Here's why I'm telling you this. If I had not gone into business with my dad, I might have wrongly gone into full-time pastoring with the thought that everybody acts like y'all are acting today all the time. You see, I, I wouldn't know that some of y'all are battling at home and screaming at each other or calling each other everything in the book and, you know, threatening this and threatening that. I wouldn't know that. But the fact is, I went out into the world and I realized these people sitting in the pews that I go to church with, they don't act like this during the week. Do you understand what I'm saying? Everybody got it real quiet in here. But the fact is, folks, when Jesus calls us to be pure in heart, if you're poor in spirit, you've come to the realization you aren't pure in heart. You're anything but pure in heart. Your life is different on Sunday than it is during the week apart from Jesus' intervention and in changing your spirit. So what is, what, is, what is Jesus not talking about? What is an example of what he's not saying is good? In his day, many of the religious authorities, that's the scribes and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, in his day, many of the authorities claimed to serve people, but they were not pure in heart. You know, today, whether politicians, ministry, business people, you know, they'll tell you, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for the people. I'm all about folks. So I'm, you know, a used car. I'm selling cars because I want to make sure you get a good car. Well, only a few of those folks out there. Everybody's looking out for themselves for the most part. And in Jesus' time, he was basically going to call the religious leaders out for what they were, a bunch of hypocrites, phony playing a role but lacking internal integrity. Look in Matthew chapter 23 with me for a few minutes. And Matthew 23 is one of the most severe moments of Jesus rebuking hypocrisy in all of the Bible. We find words in Matthew 23 that are strongly in contrast with the Beatitudes. Now, 
How many Beatitudes are there? Somebody say it out loud. Eight. There's eight Beatitudes divided uh, by the force in each section. When you come to Matthew chapter 23, as Jesus rebukes the religious authorities of his day, he strips them of their hypocrisy. What you will find as you read Matthew 23 is that there are eight woe unto you. Eight woes. Now you look and you start counting and you'll find if you have the NIV translation of the Bible, verse 14 is not there. Look there at verses 13 and 15. You never notice that, have you? Verse 14 is missing. You're going to have a footnote in your NIV. It's down in the footnotes. And that's because of something I'll tell you about another day when I have time. But put it back in there. So when you put it back in there and you start circling the woes, you got eight woes. Woe unto whom? Who's he talking to? Let's read verses 25 through 28 just for an example. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but the inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees. First clean the inside of the cup and the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Do you hear that? Clean the inside so that the outside is clean. Now go back to where you're full of robbery and self-indulgence. What happened on Monday of Holy Week? When Jesus went into Jerusalem, the Monday before he was crucified, what did he do? He cleansed the temple, got rid of the money changers, turned over their tables. Why? Because the religious leaders had worked out a system where they would extort you for the cost of a pigeon, a dove, or for your sacrifice. And they were using blemished animals. Basically, they were ripping people off, okay? It it was really a, a... a heavy-duty buy-here, pay-here kind of deal, high interest rates, everything was not good. And Jesus said, you're, you're distracting people from worship, you're hindering people, you're robbing them blind, and he's accusing them here of being hypocrites. He said, for you're like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. I don't know if you've ever done this or not, but you ought to go sometime to Westview Cemetery or Oakland Cemetery in Atlanta. How many of you have ever gone to one of the two places? You drive through there and you see big-time names from Atlanta history, mayors, governors, Coca-Cola people that own, and you see all these, and they've got these massive tombs, and they're amazing. And listen, it's a, night, it's a fun thing to do across the country to go to cemeteries and see how people spend their money. I mean, it's crazy at the cost of these things. But if you go to Israel and you go up specifically on the Mount of Olives, and if I'm standing on the Mount of Olives, I've kind of given you this illustration before, the Temple Mount would be over there to the west and there would be a great wall and the eastern gate would be right there. And so you go down on the Mount of Olives on the Palm Sunday Road into the Garden of Gethsemane, cross the Kidron Valley up to the Eastern Gate. Well, today, here's what it looks like. On the Mount of Olives, it is solid white. Why? Because of tombs. The Jewish people are buried on the Mount of Olives facing the Temple Mount. So when you're buried, if I'm a Jewish male and I'm buried in my tomb and wrapped up, My head is so, when I come up, I see the eastern gate. Why do they do that? Why do we do it? When I go into cemetery, the guy will say, the head's on this end, and I'll know where I go to stand. But usually, if you look, Christians are buried facing the east. So if they come up out of the grave, they're facing the east. Why? Because we're going, the the Messiah is going to come in the eastern gate of the temple mount. The Jewish people believe it. So you got the Jews here, but what are they buried in? They are buried in beautiful white tombs in the, in the valley. Christian graves with crosses in the ground, in the green grass, where the water flows down through there. By the way, all of the blood would have washed off the Temple Mount down through the Kidron Valley. But then you have the Muslims that are on the bank right along the wall. Why? 
trying to block the Jewish Messiah. You don't block Jesus, by the way. He walks on water. He can walk straight over anything you put in his path. But this is what's interesting. When you're at the north wall of the Temple Mount and you get off the bus and you take a little shortcut so that people don't have to climb the hill, uh, you come through the graveyard where the Muslims are buried. And y'all, this is very interesting. They have graffiti all over them. They throw out their garbage from the Muslim quarter right there in the cemetery. It's a mess. The Jewish side is magnificent, and the tombs are literally whitewashed. The Jews, the Christians, the Muslims, buried. What do we know about them all? Inside are dead, decaying bodies, and ultimately all that's left are bones and maybe some clothes, belt, buck, whatever they're buried in, the Jew would be buried kind of in just linen garments. And so here's the thing. These guys, Jesus said, you're dead. You're dead. You look like you're alive, but you're dead. Woe unto you. And he says, so you too outwardly appear righteous to men, verse 28, but inwardly you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Now, how did that go over with these folks? Not too well. Now, you have to remember, you had uh, conservatives and liberals among the Sanhedrin. The Sadducees were liberal. The Pharisees were conservative. And so we having, much like today, among the religious and political elite there, Jesus stripped them bare, and they didn't like it. In fact, as you see the progression of the Gospels, what are they intentionally working to do? To kill him. God knew they would do that. It's because of the depravity of their heart. He has challenged their authority. He has challenged their comfortable living. He's challenged all of this, so they're going to do away with it. But Jesus surely didn't despise anything more so among them, those that claim to serve God, than their hypocrisy. A lack of purity of heart is the problem. Notice what characterized the phony Pharisees. Chuck Swindoll, who's a famous pastor and writer, has said well these things. He said, they were big on rules, but they were little on godliness. They were big on externals, and they were little on the internal. They were big on public commands and little on personal obedience. They were big on appearance and little on reality. On the outside, they appeared righteous, righteous men, but inwardly, they were full of dead men's bones. They were full of hypocrisy. Why did Jesus hate that so much? Because it represented the antithesis of genuine servanthood. It was totally opposite of what he had come to model. Time after time, therefore, he announced to them, woe unto you. I've told you before, I, one of the most shocking things in my ministry was the time we were with some people and I was giving out drinks and sandwiches. And there was a lot of ministry people there. And a lady asked me, now, now what do you do again? She said, didn't you say you're a pastor? I said, well, yes, ma'am. She said, you're the senior pastor? I said, well, yes, and she said, and you're serving Cokes and sandwiches? She was a pastor's wife. And she was appalled that I was doing this. I didn't have a dog in the race at the game. And I found it fun. Would you like something? Listen, the people had provided lots of food. And I was excited. I could just take them stuff. You want another cookie? You want another sandwich? You want another this? And I was just taking it back and forth, talking to people. This lady thought I should be sitting in some chair on a pedestal which told me about what they thought. No, the greatest privilege in all the world is serving Jesus by doing menial tasks sometimes that nobody else wants to do. Think about what nurses do. I mean, think about it later. Spend some time thinking about, well, think about what mommies do. I use that term because mommy correlates to little children. Think about what happens. And y'all, think about 
as parents age and get to the point they can't take care of themselves any longer, what children have to do for their parents. When my grandmother was dying of lung cancer, this strong, independent, educated woman, and her body was frail and she was so weak she couldn't even get up to go to the potty. And one day I put my arms under her in her little gown and I picked her up and as I had her up, I'm just going to tell you what I had to do with this woman that was my hero in life. I had her up and while I had her up, I had to lift her dress enough to sit her on the potty and she looked up at me with these sick, weak, frail eyes and she shook her head and I said, what is wrong, grandmother? She said, no child should have to do this for their parent. See, I mean, she looked at me like a son. My parents were so young. And I, and I said this to her. I looked her in the eyes, sitting on a porta potty by her bed. And I said, Grandmother, the greatest privilege of my life to this point is serving you today. I said, You have spent your life serving and giving and doing for us. This is a blessing, this is not a problem. And listen, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to find the opportunity to serve people. I'm going to tell you something. When people leave our home, and I've worked and worked and worked to cook what I hope is a good meal, I'm telling you, when people leave our home and I close the gate after everybody's gone and I sit in the clean house and I sit down after we've cleaned up the dishes, I feel the pleasure of God in my life. Because I've done what he designed me to do. Cha-cha, when you help somebody to figure out what's causing their pain and you bring them relief along with all the team that surrounds you, you you ought to feel the pleasure of God. I know you know what I'm talking about because you're helping. When you're working down there with the school and the church in Kenya from all the way up here, you feel the pleasure of God, don't you? Listen, folks, when you help somebody that's... You know what I'm saying... Maybe you don't know what I'm saying. The Pharisees did not know what I'm saying because they walked around like this and people opening the doors and and doing everything for them because they didn't understand they were supposed to be servant shepherds. Not shepherds that were served. And the sad thing is there's a lot of confused people in the ministry and in the church. We're supposed to basically try to outgive each other to the glory of God. Not for gain, but for his glory. Jesus said, woe unto you. Blessed are the pure, he said, in heart, for they shall see God. The Pharisees liked the idea of the blessed or the pure, but as long as the statement stopped right there, because they were experts in outward purity, they had innumerable rules and regulations covering what you ate, what you wore, how far you could walk on the Sabbath. Listen, you go to Israel and you see these little buckets, it's because you got to wash your hands a certain way as the law requires. The law is good, but what we have to understand, the law is not meant to be lived out just to live a bunch of Uh, rules out so you can look good these guys scored an A on the rule book test but they flunked the inner purity test to them this beatitude would have read something like this as one writer said blessed are the outwardly clean for they shall see God that's what they hoped it meant but we must understand that God is far more interested in what what we are on the inside than what we do on the outside. In fact, one of the prophets said uh, from God spoke to him, tell my people their burnt offerings and their sacrifices I do not desire but a broken and a contrite heart. Uh, You see, sometimes our outward religiosity is a stench in the nostrils of God because our heart doesn't match it. 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord said to Samuel when he was looking at Jesse's sons, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. 
We all try to look good on the outside, don't we? All try to look good. Women are consumed as a whole with looking good, and many feel poorly about themselves because they don't look like this person or they don't look like that person in the, in the magazine. Let me tell you something. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but what? A woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Acts 13, 22, I have found David, the son of Jesse. God said, a man after my heart who will do all of my will. We all know that Je David uh, messed up. We all know that David was a mortal man. But the fact is, God saw him with a pure heart because his intention was to honor the Lord in his life. And God knows the difference between somebody that's faking and somebody that's just falling. It speaks of single-minded devotion and integrity that Jesus calls for in the sixth beatitude. Second Chronicles 16.9 says, and listen, this is an amazing scripture. I want you to think about this. God in heaven above, listen to what it says. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose hearts are completely his. God delights in those that delight in him. Watch over your heart, Proverbs 4, 23 says, with all diligence, for from it flow springs of life. Now let's go back. We know what it's not, hypocrisy, just an outward shell of, with empty living inside. But what is it? Go back to 5, 8. The pure in heart, Jesus extols this virtue. The term pure literally means clean. <clears throat> the idea of being uncontaminated without corruption or alloy, without guile, sincere and honest in motive. Now, let me ask you a question, and you're going to know what I'm talking about. I'm, not going to, I'm trying not to give anybody any ideas. You know, we've got to be careful when we talk about things because it might give somebody an idea. But red can in the basement, you know what I'm talking about? Red can in the basement. You use it when you're filling up the lawnmower, et cetera. If you were to put just, just this much in a 16-ounce glass, and then I, if I did that, just, to, just this much in the 16-ounce glass, and then I poured a Coca-Cola that was almost ice cold. In fact, it is ice cold. And when it goes over the ice, it starts freezing up like a slushy. You know how good that is when you pop the top on the Coke and it almost turns to ice. Anybody in here know what I'm talking about? It's amazing. Coke Zero now. You just perfect temperature. So if I give you this much that came out of the red can and this much that came out of the Coke bottle, do you want the glass? Do you? No. Why? I, well, it's just a little bit. I just, I needed to use this cup. I had poured some stuff in the carburetor to get the car to crank. I don't have another cup. Just drink it. No, you don't want it because it's what? It's contaminated. It's adulterated. It's mixed up. If it's metals and you say, well, I've just put some tin in with the gold, you have, it's alloy. It's two metals that are brought together. That's what this means. It's not. It's not alloy. It's not multiple metals brought together to fill up something. It's not something that's mixed with something else to fill up the pan. It is pure. It is clean. It's honest. Jeremiah reminds us that unfortunately the heart of man is the source of all our troubles. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Proverbs 20, verse 9, asks this question. You answer it. Who can say, I have kept my heart pure. I am clean and without sin. Who among us can say that? No one except Jesus Christ. You and I cannot say that we've kept our hearts pure, that we are clean and without sin. All of humanity, apart from Jesus, must remain silent in answer to that other than to say no. John said this in chapter, uh, 1 John 1, 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Paul, who writes again and again 
about the joyful certainty of spending eternity in heaven. He said this in Romans 7, For what I do is not the good I want to do. Hear the apostles say that. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this is what I keep doing. Paul is saying I'm in a battle of the flesh, even as a Christ follower. What I do not want to do, I keep doing. What I want to do, I do not do. It is the battle of the flesh. It is because Satan uh, causes us to be tempted and sin keeps rearing its ugly head in our life. I don't know how many of you would admit it, but I gained 10 to 15 pounds during the coronavirus season. Anybody else want to admit that you gained weight? Miriam and I cooked every night. When Ben was home, we had southern uh, good food every, every night, literally. I mean, we cooked like we've never cooked. We had, I mean, we were making cornbread, biscuits, you name it, honey, uh, apple butter. We, we, no, nothing was barred. And look at the results. I can't button the jacket today. This is not. Let me tell you something, folks. I, I want to admit it for the 1,000th times 1,000th time. I am a glutton. Anybody else? I love food. I love it. And I'm telling you, I struggle to stay away from it. This week, all I have had to eat is boiled eggs, bacon, and salads from Bojangles. Let me put in a plug for Bojangles. You know that their chicken, grilled chicken salad costs $5, and it's double the size of anybody else's salad, and it's just as good. Go get you some, put some hoop cheese on it, grate you some at home, throw in some bacon and a couple of black olives. You got an amazing salad. Don't laugh at me. That's what I'm having for lunch. I bought it last night, two of them. You can get the hoop cheese at Costco for 7 bucks. There's no better hoop cheese around, I'm telling you. It helps Kenny Armour to be able to tithe. Listen, I am a glutton. I have a stash. Like alcoholics have alcohol. Listen, last night, Julianne drove open the drawer at my home, and praise God, she found the Baby Ruth candy bars I didn't even know we had. <laughs> I made it all week long with no sugar until Julianne found the drawer that I had forgotten where I'd stuffed the stuff. I didn't tell Miriam, but I ate one. I have a problem. I don't want to overeat. I don't want to binge eat. I don't want to eat the whole pecan pie in a week. No, excuse me, three days from Sam's. But I do it. I'm telling you people, if I ever drank, if you are my friend and you tried to encourage me to drink alcohol, what you would encourage me to do is to become a drunk because I know myself well enough to know if I ever started drinking, I would be a stumbling, drunk, alcoholic, and there would be no turning my life around. I'm telling you, I know myself well enough to know. I have a problem. I like old cars. Fortunately, I can tell Miriam that they're, they're retirement assets. And we're both buying it today. Paul said, I can't stop doing it. Why? Because it's an issue of the heart. There is nothing in the Bible which gives anyone the right to claim sinless perfection on this side of the grave. We can't do it. A.W. Pink rightly says this, One of the most conclusive evidences that we do possess a pure heart, listen, one of the most conclusive evidences that we do possess a pure heart, as Jesus speaks of, is to be conscious of and burdened with the impurity which still indwells us. In other words, as you're growing in Christ, and to be pure in heart means you are very aware when you're not living in a manner that is pleasing to God, and you begin to want to do something about it. So conviction of sin and purity of heart are by no means incompatible, he said. The gospel promises are not to those who think themselves perfect, but to those who grieve over their imperfection and yet long to be holy. Long to be holy. I know a lot of you fairly well, and I, I, I don't look at you and think, that person just flat out wants to blatantly grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We don't want to do that, do we? 
No, we want to please the Holy Spirit of God. But the problem is we're fallen and we keep doing this because it's a battle and we're never going to be completely set free. You know, there are some preaching a gospel that says that there's a second work of grace and by doing that, you're not going to sin again for the rest of your life. I haven't met any of those people that can convince me of that. James 4.8, listen to this, come near to God and he will come near to you. Y'all, I don't know about you, but when I hear that, I, I just think if God senses me taking a step towards him, I'm doing what he wants me to do. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. So how can a person have a pure heart? Well, first we got to understand it is the work of God. I'm taking a sermon that I had and I'm breaking it into multiple parts. When we think about being pure in heart, there is positional purity, there is practical purity, and there is perfected purity. I want to just mention positional purity and just a beginning point, and we'll pick this back up week after next. Nick's going to preach next week. Miriam and I will be out of town officiating at a wedding. Why does Jesus say that we should be pure in heart? The reason is because our heart, our inner being, is the root of all our action. From our hearts come all of our motives, our desires, our goals, our emotions. If our hearts aren't right, our actions will not be right ultimately. Jesus put it this way in Mark 7, 21 and 22. From within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, and you name it, out of the heart. Thus, to have a pure heart means having pure thoughts, pure motives, a pure will, and pure emotions. God requires purity at the very center of our being in our heart. How many of you watched uh, Prince Philip's uh, funeral yesterday? Any of you watch? Man, there's just something about the way the UK does things. You know, a lot of us are descendants from there in this room or somewhere close by. In the monarchy, while we all celebrate freedom and they enjoy freedom now, the, the, everything is done with intentionality. Have you ever, has anybody in here ever seen Queen Elizabeth without being, everything being proper. We've not seen it in public. Queen Elizabeth is always proper. Rarely do you catch a smile. I saw the picture this week of uh, an old picture of Prince Philip dressed in one of the royal guards, you know, with a big furry hat and the red suit. He was standing there, and the queen was walking by, and she's laughing because she realizes it's her husband dressed up impersonating one of those guys. Somebody asked me yesterday, did they show her face in the funeral? Yes, just like always. 73 years of marriage at the funeral, everything just like this. Where do you think you've got to be on the pole of being good soldiers and qualifications and all of these things to serve at Buckingham Palace? Wouldn't you think you've got to be pretty high on the chart to get there? Or, if, or better yet, to be a bodyguard, a secret service type agent for the queen and for Prince Philip and the family. You've probably got to have some pretty strong qualifications and be prepared. Let me ask you, if somebody had showed up yesterday at the palace before the funeral that was going to be on worldwide TV and they'd worked on their car the night before and had grease all over their hands, do you think the queen's people would have approved them being on the TV? No. No they got to be pure to serve the queen. Y'all, are we in right standing before God to serve the gospel of Jesus Christ? You see, you and I have to understand something. We cannot make ourselves right. You can't do it as hard as you try. Psalm 51 says, Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Here's what the psalmist knew. He could not do it on his own. And so what did he do? He said, Lord, I don't have it, but would you give it to me? A clean heart. 
Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Lord, do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. God wants to give us a pure heart. Y'all, we can't gain it. He gives it. He will. He does this first of all when you and I turn to Jesus Christ in repentance, when we turn from our sin, when we turn from the prince of this world, Satan himself, and when we we bow the knee of our heart and we say, Lord, forgive me, save me, a sinner. 1 John 1, 7 says, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all of our sin. From all of our sin. We were going to look at Romans today, but I'm going to save that for the next time we gather. I want to just read to you again from Ephesians. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and in your sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. Do you realize that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead to teach us something? Lazarus had been in the grave four days. His body was decaying. He could not do anything to come out of the grave. He couldn't do anything to restore his health. He was helpless and hopeless. But God, Jesus, the sisters wanted him to get there sooner to touch Lazarus and to heal him. They knew he could. But Jesus got there right on time, the fourth day. And he stood outside the tomb. Who was he? He was the creator and is the sustainer of all things. By the strength of his right hand, all things are held together. You realize Jesus created man? Read Colossians 1. Jesus stood at the tomb of Lazarus spoke to dead, decaying tissue, to a spirit, and he said, Lazarus, come forth. He was saying, I want you to come out of physical death and live again. And what happened? But the grave clothes started moving. And Lazarus comes waltzing. I don't know how he did it the way he would have been wrapped up. He come out, came out like this. And when he got out there and he's standing there and everybody's dumbfounded that he's alive, what did Jesus say? Loose him and let him go. Cut the grave clothes off. Let the man live. Now, he died again. You know that, right? But he never died spiritually if his faith was in Jesus Christ. And so what we have to understand is We were dead in our transgressions and sins. It is by grace you have been saved, verse 6, and God raised us up with Christ and has seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves, For it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. No Pharisee, no Sadducee, no tax collector, no fisherman, no teacher, no doctor, no preacher, no shepherd. Nobody can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Y'all, we don't work to be saved. We work because we are saved. And it is by grace through faith that we are saved. And so as we think about it, we're going to come back to this idea of positional purity week after next. But in case you don't come back, how can a heart be made pure? 
that heart that is above all things wicked and deceitful. How can it be made pure? By faith in the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament says in Leviticus, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The whole Old Testament, over and over again, blood was shed as a foreshadowing of the blood Jesus would shed. It was, it was teaching them of something that would one day be sufficient once and for all, as Hebrews said. We put our faith in the blood of Jesus. Y'all, one little drop of Jesus' blood was sufficient to save all of mankind and cover our sins, but he gave it all. He didn't go and give a little vial to the lab. He spilt it all on the earth. And think about that later. When people don't have enough blood, they're weak, they're frail and near death or die. I want you to think about something. You don't often think about Jesus spilt his blood out and was wrapped bloodless without blood in his arteries and his veins and put in a tomb dead. But when he walked out, his blood was sufficient to carry him into eternity. Listen, you got to put your faith in the atoning blood of Jesus. Nothing else will save you. Secondly, your heart can be made pure not only by being saved by the blood of Christ, but by continually abiding in the presence of the Lord as you listen to and hear and learn His truth and you live it out, abiding in the truth. And what did Jesus say about Himself? I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. To abide with Him. Y'all, do you realize you and I get to abide in the presence of the Most High? And then by continually confessing our sins. Peter said, Lord, wash me from head to toe. And he said, those who've been washed do not need to be re-washed, but only their feet need to be washed. For us in our culture, it's, it's not our feet that need washing, it's our hands. Lord, my hands are impure, my hands are dirty because it's an overflow of my heart. Then the Lord says, confess your sin. For he who confesses his sin, if we confess our sin... He is faithful and just to do what? Forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So how do we have a pure heart? It starts with putting our faith in the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. To atone means to cover. It's as though the blood of Jesus covers us before God and makes us clean by abiding with him. Y'all, Jesus doesn't want to save us to send us out on our own. He wants to dwell with us and us with him. And we can do that, but we need to confess, Lord, just like Paul, I'm doing the things I don't want to do. Help me. And that's where Ephesians 5 comes in, surrendering to the Spirit. Let's pray together.